The processing steps I'm going to perform in this video are aimed at illustrating how a spectrum that has been measured over a, a large area analysis is an average spectrum and may not be truly representative of the chemistry of the sample as presented. So there are pitfalls in simply doing spectroscopy on its own if we don't understand the nature of the sample that we're analysing. In this video I'd like to illustrate how spectra respond to the composition of the sample where the sample is a material with an oxide film. Here we have a sample that is a silicon wafer with an oxide layer on the surface and the oxide layer has been engineered so that there are different thicknesses of this oxide at different positions on the sample. So by imaging the sample we can identify where the different film thicknesses of oxide are and by measuring a stack of these images we can then retrospectively create spectra from different zones on the sample. Each image in this stack has been measured at a different energy and with each measurement the energy is incremented by a uniform step size so we end up with effectively a spectrum at each pixel within this set of images. We illustrate what these images look like as a stack by plotting these in three dimension. And we can see as these images slowly display that the image changes depending on whether we're on an oxide or on the elemental form of the silicon. The relationship between spectra and images can be further illustrated by observing these images overlaid and enabling an option that is on the color scales property page of the image processing dialog window and that is display spectrum. If I tick this box and press apply then what we see is a marker that indicates a pixel and over the image data is a spectrum drawn that allows us to see what a spectrum at a given pixel looks like. Now this is a point in the image where there's not much signal so the spectrum is hard to recognize. However there is an option that allows the integration of pixels over an area. I've just marked a box and when I press set position then each pixel within this box is integrated in terms of the spectra and then the sum of all these integrated pixel spectra is plotted over the image and what we see is a typical spectrum from a silicon wafer with an amount of oxide formed on the surface a small amount of oxide so this represents thin oxide on elemental silicon and we know this is elemental silicon because of the plasmon structure we see here that's very typical of elemental silicon so these two peaks here represent different oxidation states of silicon now if we move to a different position so I've clicked with a mouse and then I'm going to say shift position what this shift position did was it moved the box and now I see I've got an area of the sample which when I integrate all of these pixels I end up with a spectral shape which is typical of a silicon dioxide. We have a single peak and a relatively flat background with a broad response to the background for this silicon peak. What I'm illustrating is that we have within this sample both silicon oxide and thin films of silicon oxide on elemental silicon. So by using data of this form and massaging the data in different ways we ought to be able to pick out pixels that will give us a variation between the thin film and the thick film as we move from one to the other. Since the objective is to find spectra that blend between the mostly silicon and the mostly oxide part of this sample somehow I need to be able to identify pixels within these images that have variations in oxide thickness. 
Now the way I'm going to do this is using principal component analysis and this permits me to calculate a set of images that are abstract images. Now I've already worked out what I want to do on these data and it turns out that if I simply calculate the first 40 abstract factors for these data then the top two abstract factors provide shapes within the image that actually characterize the different forms of the oxide. So I'm going to do this calculation. I've specified 40 scans. The reason I've specified 40 is that there are actually 151 images in the stack and I don't want to calculate all 151 abstract factors. That would take far too long. So what I'm going to do is comb the data set, place approximations to abstract factors in the first 40 images. So these will become semi-abstract factors and then I can calculate from the 40 the abstract factors that are of significance to these data. And this is a way of removing the overhead of time that would be required to calculate all 151 abstract factors. So having said that, I'm going to press the button that says OPS. This means optimum scale. It's a method for trying to compensate for variations of noise with respect to signal within data to try and optimize the signal. So when I press OPS, usually this provides a reasonable set of abstract factors that minimize the shapes that might be introduced by noise. Well, it's not always the case that the abstract factors yield useful images. In this case, the second abstract factor does yield an image that partitions the information in terms of oxide, of thick form, and elemental silicon. So I'm going to make use of this image to classify the pixels as the sample changes from mostly elemental to mostly oxide. In order not to lose this abstract factor when I reset the data, I'm going to copy the processed data into a new file. I could have copied it into the same file, but if I leave the original file as it is and simply take a copy of this process data, so there's no processing history here, that's correct. So I can now go back to the original file and reset the process data back to the original data. There's an option on the image quantification property page that resets selected VAMAS box. So I can simply select and then press this button and it will reset all of the data back to the original state. So I can return to the file that now contains the abstract factor and I will do a bit more processing on these data. I'd like to have a smooth gradient between where there's elemental silicon and where there's the oxide and I can achieve this by smoothing the data several times. So the idea is that I now have intensities that are representative of either elemental, the oxide, and then some blend of the two as we move between one and the other. Since I've processed these data further, I'll take a copy of the processed data so that I preserve what I've just done. This will permit me to return the original abstract factor back to the state while still having a copy of that image now processed so that I can attempt to create a false color scale which will be used to classify the pixels within this image. The false color scale will allow me to compute spectra from these pixels. So let's produce a false color scale that classifies these pixels according to the intensity as seen within this abstract factor. So if I turn on the false color scale. We can now see the gradient more clearly and I will indicate I want the full range of intensities that the color scale down the side of the image is indicating. Select the Add False Color button, we'll use 8, 
eight steps so this will produce eight different colors I'll turn off the histogram equalization and let's just look at the colors according to the spectra as if I was overlaying spectra in a, a, a tile because ultimately that's what I want to do I want to create a set of eight spectra that I can then overlay and examine how the different oxide and elemental forms of silicon appear as photo emission peaks in spectra so when I press the OK button the color of the image changes according to the new false color intervals that we see here then I can go to the image processing dialog window and I can define the image from false color so this means that I'm going to define a mask that will be used when I calculate spectra so I press this button and as we see there's a, a repeat image appears in the top left hand corner so this is the state of the image that will be used to calculate from the original images spectra that are either from the red region or the blue region or from different parts of the image based on these colors that have been assigned by this false color operation so let's now move to the file containing the images I converted these back to the raw image data and this means that when I add the pixels together I'm using raw intensities not processed intensities but the raw intensities so this is an important aspect of calculating these spectra because it means that I'm taking the spectra with the counting statistics that were defined by these images so I'll press the sum spectra using colors button and then we end up with a set of false color spectra one for each color indicated by the lookup table 0 to 7 and when I overlay these these are now displayed with the same colors that were used in the false color image so I can identify the spectra with the colors from the false color image the reason I created these false color spectra was to illustrate how different thicknesses of an oxide on silicon can alter the shape of the spectra now to see this clearly I have to do some kind of normalization the number of pixels that we use for each color has influenced the intensity of these spectra so one way of normalizing these data is to use the spectrum processing dialog window and the calculator property page and using this normalize button when I press the normalize button all the spectra are converted to the same intensity in the sense that each spectrum represents a vector and they have now been normalized in the Euclidean sense of the word so this is not normalizing at a point it's not normalizing over range this is just a mathematical trick to get the spectra to appear on a similar scale if I zoom in we now see that the film thickness as indicated by the intensity of the oxide peak relative to the elemental peak does have an impact on the relative offset between the oxide and the elemental peak if I look at the full oxide signal which is this blue curve and then I go to the red signal which is the other extreme where there was the least oxide I can see that there's about 0 0.9 EV shift between the two now whether this is chemical or related to the potential on the surface which is induced by different thicknesses of the oxide layer well that's open to debate but you can certainly see that as a consequence of different oxide thicknesses you end up with a variation in position in terms of binding energy of the oxide peak